Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, whenever you are. Thank you for watching my videos. I'm here joined with Chris from Emma Crypto. Hey guys, thanks, thanks Da Vinci for having me. Oh man, great to have you on the show, man. Every single time we, we get together, we do an awesome show. This is going to be another great show talking about Bitcoin, talking about uh, basically where our projections are of Bitcoin in 10 years from now. And what are the risks of owning Bitcoin over a 10 year period? And what should we, what should people do to mitigate against those risks? Right? Those are very important questions, right? That people need to have answered because a lot of people are not traders like you and I are. They are hodlers. They are hodlers of last resort. They're not going anywhere. They're not taking their Bitcoin and selling it at whenever the price dumps. They're not taking their Bitcoin and selling it when the price goes up. No, they're hodling for the day when Bitcoin is money. Aren't you doing the same thing, really? Aren't you? You're not trading with everything, right? No, I mean, I'm talking about trading every day, but I'm also mentioning every second day, at least, that I'm holding 97% or so in a hodling portfolio, right? If my trading, and then when I'm making profits in the trading portfolio, I'm constantly taking out into my hodling portfolio, right? If I grow my trading portfolio 10x, which happened recently, well, I take Bitcoin out and put them into my trading portfolio. I think it is truly the best thing to do. And usually, I'm always saying, you can either, there are three different kinds of people. The smartest people learn from other people's mistakes. The second smartest people learn from their own mistakes. And the dumbest people learn from no mistakes at all. And if I'm looking at other people in the history, people investing their Bitcoin in companies, people trading and losing their Bitcoin, people losing their private key, whatever, like they lost their Bitcoin. Everyone is regretting that they were even touching them from their cold storage. So I might as well just learn from all of these people's mistake and keep hodling them no matter what. I don't even try to sell the top of the bull market. I just hold them no matter what. This is my game plan. And yeah, thanks for, thanks for asking this very important question. Exactly. Yeah, that's my game plan as well. But the reasons why we do that is really simple, right? But the reason why we do that is because we see a, a bright future for Bitcoin, a very bright future for Bitcoin. In fact, uh, we're going to um, talk about where we think Bitcoin is going to go in about 10 years from now, what we think we'll, we'll see. So for example, when I first got into Bitcoins, I, I foresaw that Bitcoins were going to grow to a very high price. I didn't foresee, I didn't say that, hey, you know what, one day uh, MicroStrategies or companies will start putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet. But I was pretty sure that I, I, if, I, if I really thought about it, I'm sure that I would probably come up with that idea. And I was never really asked that question. So now I'm asking Chris this question, and I'm going to answer it myself as well, is that what do you see in the future that's going to be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that's happening now, but it's the natural evolution of what uh, Bitcoin really is. What do you see in the future uh, for Bitcoin uh, in the next 10 years, basically? So when we talk about in 10 years or in the next 10 years, let me start with the next event, which is already up and coming. And then I'm answering your question. In the first week of February, Michael Saylor himself, who made this billion dollar bet with his own portfolio and micro strategy, he is inviting a thousand executives from which some of them are S&P 500 company, uh, comp uh, S&P 500 listed company executives, Nasdaq listed companies. He is inviting those people, sharing his playbook and making it easy for them to buy Bitcoin and put it into their treasury. So I think in the immediate future, already talking about this year, we will have the vast majority, or like a lot of companies, already joining Bitcoin. Um, then talking about in 10 years. I think we will already have soaked up all these uh, corporations and Bitcoin has reached a certain degree of maturity. I mean, we are talking about in 10 years, Bitcoin is 21 years old, right? The internet was 21 years old and we already had like grandmas surfing in the internet. So I think in 10 years, we will have reached maturity. People buying Bitcoin will be, everyone who is selling milk in the grocery store, he will be receiving Bitcoin. So he's buying Bitcoin by selling milk. Someone who is selling his house is going to be received Bitcoin. So I think every day transactions is Bitcoin purchases and Bitcoin sells. So I, I, I see Bitcoin as money in 10 years. And I think grandmas are going to buy Bitcoin 
when they are selling their old bicycle or whatever, right? This is what I'm seeing in 10 years. I think in 10 years, we already have all these people involved and Bitcoin has reached a certain degree of maturity, low volatility, high market cap, and um, it is already a safe haven. This is what I'm seeing in my mind. What do you think, Da Vinci? Well, I'm seeing that uh, we're going to see countries and uh, central banks purchasing Bitcoin to uh, back up their currency. Now, I think we'll still have currencies in 10 years. Uh, the governments are not going to give up the, the ability to print money um, that easily. Uh, they, but it will uh, make it very things will Bitcoin will make things very difficult for them because people will prefer to transact directly into Bitcoin. But they will try to force the majority of the citizens to to use the local currency as best they can. But you know, uh, if you've ever been to uh, any country that suffered through hyperinflation or suffered through um, through uh, what's it called the, the the governments preventing other governments or the United States preventing other people from trading with them, right? Uh, sanctions. That's what it's called. Uh, you notice that they, they're not allowed to trade in dollars, but they trade in dollars anyways when you're there. You're actually, when you uh, get in a taxi, you're paying with dollars, right? Even though it's illegal, right? So we're going to basically get get to that point. We're going to see a lot of countries. I don't say, I'm not saying it's the United States. I'm not saying it's Europe or anything, but we're going to see a lot of countries like that where you're just going to go there with your Bitcoins. And yeah, yeah, people accept the local currency, but they also accept Bitcoins. And also, I'm gonna. I, I, I have to say, man, the, the, you know, your uh, the government officials, right? They'll be accepting bribes and uh, money donations in bitcoins, even though it's probably illegal in the country. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's the thing. I mean, Da Vinci, what you are saying, I'm pretty sure some people watching are saying, Da Vinci, are you crazy? This is not gonna happen. Well, just go 10 years back on Da Vinci's channel. If you don't believe him now, people didn't believe him 10 years ago. You might as well believe what he's saying now, because I agree with you. I see that coming. I, I think this is the future of Bitcoin. And um, I think the scenario you were just outlaying is extremely realistic. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And now, now we want to talk about what the risks are, right? Uh, basically, people who want to hold their Bitcoins, they want to see what could possibly make them lose their Bitcoins as they, tr as they try to save up for this uh, grandiose future that both of us see. And I believe that will play out in the next 10 years. Uh, what are the risks that do you foresee that could possibly occur between now and then so that so that each person can uh, help mitigate themselves from those risks that you possibly see? And I'll also answer that question as well. Well, they are, they are like all different kind of risks. I think one big risk is the storage risk, right? I mean, you are your own bank. You're not holding your Bitcoin at, the, at, at, on your, at your bank. At least you shouldn't do that. I think the best way is to hold custody yourself. But at the same time, if you are effing it up, then you're losing your private key or something like that, or like something is burning and your private key is burning, then you also lose your, your ledger or treasure. Well, it's gone. So um, I personally think it's good to spread among different hardware wallets, for example, uh, either write it down um, on a piece of paper, or like something, you put a foil over it, change some words according to numbers you have in your mind and um, yeah, put it, implement a few security measurements. And that will already, if you decentralize it on different space, uh, places, that will de help decrease the risk because you will not lose all of your private keys right at the same time so having different private keys stored at different places that could be already good um, and another risk is i think it's it's greed the biggest risk is greed probably many people will try to outperform the market will try to sell the top and maybe i'm going to diversify out into real estate into equity a little bit but the matter of fact is my bitcoin i'm not gonna try to outperform the market with that if i'm diversifying out it's for another reason so I think many people, they will maybe sell at $100,000 because some model is saying that at $200,000. But what if it goes to 400 and you buy back at 320? And then at 400, you think it goes to 500, it goes down. You sell at 250 and like, it's just a big, big mess if you try to outperform the market. So I think many people will lose their Bitcoin by just outperform, by not outperforming the market because in the end of the day, the highest likelihood is that you are not part of the small amount of people who are actually able to outperform the market. So this would be my biggest advice. Keep care, keep track of your storage, 
decentralize it a little bit and just hold no matter what, right? Yeah, I, you know, I totally agree. I never really thought about that. It's your own personal greed is the biggest risk uh, to you at this point in time because a lot of people have always asked me the same question. The rich, I just want to sell at the top and buy back at the bottom. Can you just help me out with that? Just that. <laughs> it's it's yeah. your own personal greed that actually will be your uh, undoing. So, um, yeah, if you just hold, hold along for the 10 years, you'll be safe. Now, another issue, right, is that I get the, a lot of emails, a lot of messages of people losing their private key. They, or they overcomplicate their, uh, their, 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 their storage means, right? So, for example, one person just recently sent me a message saying, hey, uh, I have a hard ledger hardware wallet, but then I put it in a passphrase, right? Because you could actually have your money in, uh, in the default value of the, the hardware wallet, so the default settings, or you can put a passphrase, which means that you uh, have to remember that passphrase so that you can get to the money, but nobody else knows that you have that money unless they know that passphrase with, along with your private key for your ledger wallet, right, or treasure wallet. And so um, uh, it's basically so that if somebody puts a gun to your head, hey, show me all your, uh, every, all your assets inside of your, your uh, hardware wallet, you could just show them what the default is and it could be pennies there. And that's fine. It's just that uh, uh, a lot of people end up forgetting what their, their passphrase is and they end up losing all their money, which is one case that I noticed. So try to not, um, I know you want to mitigate the risk of somebody pointing a gun to you and, and hey, taking all your Bitcoins, but that is such a low risk that it's not worth overcomplicating your security measures to do so. I say keep it simple, stupid, and, and you will be able to um, you will be able to get get through the next ten years and have that money on the other side. Uh, yeah, sure, there will be sometimes people who do have bad luck and uh, uh, and and they get robbed, but it, most likely that's not going to happen to you. And so I would suggest keep it simple and don't worry about it. Also, uh, one of the other risks that uh, are associated with Bitcoin, of course, is governmental risk. They will um, actually come down knocking at your door and try to take your Bitcoins from you. Now, one of the things people would do with their gold and silver was try to hide it from that, that potential risk. And I can, um, I, can, I can give you some um, ideas on how to, to best hide your money. One of the more things I've, what I suggest for people to do is to place the, the Bitcoins inside of an old television, the, the, the hardware wallet inside of an old television, the middle of the big tube television, right? Nobody's going to look in there because it has a lot of space, a lot of electronic components, and nobody's going to take that from your house. Nobody's going to rob that from your house. And so you could hide it by opening it up with a screwdriver and placing your, your, uh, your uh, hardware wallet inside that huge space. Now, the only thing is that you do have to make sure that your wife or significant other does not throw out the television, but that is one place that you can hide your hardware wallet, right? Uh, what else there's, do you have in this suggestion? There's another problem. Uh, the fact that you are mentioning this specific trick in a video with 50,000 people watching potentially. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great trick. Maybe you guys are thinking about anything else than a big TV now. <laughs> but I think it's a great idea. Something big, something which is not valuable, something people don't want, right? Um, so that is uh, that is a very good, very good idea. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is, especially coming back to the Greek where you are actually agreeing, some people watching now, maybe you only have 0 0.01 Bitcoin, right? Or less even. 0 0.01 Bitcoin right now is $300. And you think it's not a lot. You want more. You want one Bitcoin. So you start trading with 0 0.01 Bitcoin and um, in the, hoping that you can increase it to one Bitcoin because your goal was always to have one Bitcoin. Um, I actually think 0 0.01 Bitcoin is a lot. It's like one million Satoshi, right? One million Satoshis. If Bitcoin just goes to $15 million, the price target actually Michael Saylor was suggesting in the video we did together, that's like $150,000 for every $300 you are investing now. $150,000.
of course that's a lot in the future and he was actually talking about um, not purchasing power uh, purchasing power adjusted price already so this was actually his target so something you could buy today for hundred fifty thousand dollars for only three hundred dollar invested so imagine losing this three hundred dollars today you might think well I was trying to get a Bitcoin I only lost three hundred dollars in fact you lost one hundred fifty thousand this is why I would be holding it no matter how much you have, even if it's 0.001 Bitcoin. I think it's extremely valuable and it's not uh, made for gambling. I'm personally, I am trading, of course, but just like a few percent. And even if you are experienced, it should be a few percent of your total portfolio, I think. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show with us today. I really appreciate you having you on, on, on my channel and I love appearing on your channel as well. So anyways, uh, Bitcoin, right, it is, is, is real. Bitcoin's here to stay, man, and everybody needs to be a part of it. Thank you for watching. Cheers, people. Bye-bye.